President orders 100% levy be imposed on imported big onions. Who is being protected by the long delayed National Audit Bill? Former senior DIG Lali Jaya Singha arrested for concealing evidence in alleged murder case in 2015. Locals of Madhuriya take to the streets demanding solutions for the human elephant conflict. Angela Merkel to serve unprecedented fourth term as German Chancellor after convincing election victory. Hello there, very good evening and welcome to your Prime Time News Bulletin. I'm Shane Silver. And I'm Jitain Likulisena. Let's start off with the local stories in detail. President Maitri Pala Sirisena has instructed the Ministry of Finance to impose a 100% levy on imported big onions. The President issued the directive considering the issues faced by local big onion farmers when selling their crops. 35-40% to 40 of the country's annual requirement of big onions are produced locally from the Matale, Anuradhapura, Kurunagala and Polonaru districts. The recently experienced heavy rains caused crops of onions to rot and also caused the spread of a fungal disease. The Agricultural and Agrarian Insurance Board said close to 1,100 acres of onion crops were destroyed as a result. It added around 50% of the onion crops in the Dambul area, which produces the largest harvest of onions in Sri Lanka, were also destroyed. Residents of several villages in the Madhuri Administrative Division staged a demonstration today to protest the failure on the part of the authorities to provide a concrete solution for the long-standing human-elephant conflict. Our correspondent noted that traffic flow along the Madhuri Hingurakkoda Road was hampered throughout the day as a result of this demonstration. About 15 villages in the area including Mega Sweva, Amaga Sweva, Atamboya, Dalshanapura and Pubudugama have been affected as a result of encroaching wild elephants. Our children cannot travel to school. The elephant come into the village at 2 in the afternoon and remain there until 8 in the morning. If they catch the children, they will trample them to death. Not even one wildlife officer came to make inquiries. They said they do not have vehicles. When we said yesterday that we would demonstrate, they chase away all the elephants. We are here today protesting because we cannot earn even 1,000 rupees a day. They are drunk when they come here. One of the men who came to chase away the elephants lit a cracker near his stomach. We have submitted over 1,000 complaints in writing and verbally to relevant authorities, but nothing has been done. There is a 4 km stretch where fencing is required. We ask that the elephants be chased away from there and that a fence be erected. Meanwhile, a group of employees of the Suri Vava Divisional Secretariat staged a demonstration outside the Secretariat this morning. The employees were protesting against villagers who had forcibly detained the divisional secretary at the premises during the demonstration over the death of a woman in an elephant attack on the 14th of this month. Residents of Polpitia, who lost their homes to the Broadlands Hydropower Project in Ginigathena, staged a protest today demanding payment of the compensation they were promised. About 27 homes in Polpitia were damaged about three years ago as a result of excavations carried out to build a tunnel for the hydropower project. While authorities relocated villagers who had to evacuate due to cave-ins and fractures on the walls in rented houses, steps have not been taken to provide permanent housing. They carried out the estimation and provided it in writing, but the payments are being delayed. We ask that the amounts be disbursed as soon as possible. The protesters dispersed after the project director Kamal Kalan Surya arrived at the scene and gave a promise in writing to pay compensation within two months. Addressing a media briefing today, JVP leader Anura Kumar Desanayake commented on irregularities that have arisen with regard to the Central Expressway. As you know, there is a proposal to build an expressway from Potuhara to Galagedara. The distance is 32.5 kilometers, and they are preparing to spend a total of 135 billion rupees for this. Therefore, a kilometer will cost roughly 4.2 billion rupees. The cabinet has awarded the contract to a Japanese company, which was rejected on an early occasion. Do you believe that we should spend over 4 billion rupees of public money for a kilometer on this expressway? 
Koti Harsia Pahalavak Vekali to the Kinasad. Members of the Road Development Authority's Engineers Union made revelations today regarding money being released by the RDA to the Treasury. Four billion rupees of funds collected from the expressways has been released to the Treasury from the RDA. We have collected a total revenue of 5.6 billion and of that 4 billion has been released to cover costs for development of RDA and non-RDA roads. Because of this, we will face difficulties in maintaining the expressways. We inform the two ministers as well as the chairman and director general of the RDA. However, they have still gone ahead with it. The issue is that this money will be used to pay for non-RDA road development and to settle bills from 2016. Expressways are national resources and we are against the privatization or sale of such assets. There are three sections of the expressway that will be built on 20-foot columns. There are also three tunnels that need to be built. Our local contractors do not have this experience yet. Therefore, the CCM decided it will be difficult for local contractors to undertake section 3 of the expressway from Putuhara to Galagedara. Even though foreign contractors arrive to carry out this work, most of these foreign contractors use subcontractors. The subcontractors are local. Our subcontractors are skilled and they have been trained in how these constructions should be done. They have the technical know-how. Based on the loan scheme, there are companies brought on board in an advisory capacity. However, these companies also utilize many of our engineers. There are only a few people who come from overseas. They cannot simply say that we do not have the technical expertise. The implementation of a national audit bill was one of the cornerstones of the good governance government's election promises. Why has it been delayed? This is JVP leader Anur Kumar Disanayaka's take on the matter. The people who have been vested with the responsibility of passing the audit bill are the same cabinet members who are engaging in acts of fraud, corruption and wasteful spending. This is why this legislation has not been passed over the past 13 years. They presented the bill in April 2015. It has undergone changes over 120 times. The cabinet is yet to approve this. Since 1978, the constitution of this country has only been amended 19 times. However, this audit bill was changed 22 times in the cabinet itself. If the Prime Minister's secretary has been empowered to get this done through a cabinet paper, then it is his responsibility to provide a response as to why this is undergoing amendments over the past two and a half years. The Prime Minister's Secretary has accepted the responsibility of passing this bill. Why is the Prime Minister continuously delaying the passing of this bill which will serve to protect state assets? We believe the Prime Minister will inform the Parliament and the public about what is happening. We have our doubts as to whether the Prime Minister has chosen the side of corrupt government officials. We need to ask the Prime Minister what is the obstacle you face in getting this legislation passed. We need to question the Prime Minister who is more important corrupt officials or the general public who voted for you. Well, stay tuned to News First as we head into a short commercial break. Well, welcome back to the news. Former Mayor of the Kote Municipal Council, Janaka Ranavaka, once again leveled allegations today that Malik Samaravikrama has made an illegal construction on a property that belongs to the state. This is a letter I sent to the chairman of the UDA on the 7th of September 2017 regarding the land on which Spevil Lanka is located. I saw that Malik Samaravikrama had told a newspaper that he had leased out these two plots of land. During the coordinating meeting, I asked the RD officials who owns these lands. They say they don't know. The official appointed by the UDA does not know about the lands that come under his purview. However, Malik Samaravikrama says that he leased these lands. I have one of those 99 lease agreements. This is a lease he signed in 1994. The lease for the land that I am saying is being forcefully occupied was apparently signed in 1999. However, the UDA and its officials have no reply. Where is the deed for the land that Malik says he has leased? Where is the lease agreement? 
How can a land leased to Malik Samar Vikram by the UDA be leased out again by Malik Samar Vikram? They cannot do that. This is the law of the land. If the chairman of the UDA has a backbone, if he doesn't want to support corrupt officials, he would reveal the lease agreement signed by Malik Samar Vikram in 1999. But don't try to present fake documents which have been backdated. Then the people of this country will know whether I am saying the truth, whether the UDA chairman is saying the truth, or whether Malik Samar Vikram is telling the truth. Minister Malik Samaravikrama made a special statement in Parliament in this regard on the 6th of September. I hope to make a clarification regarding a story aired by the Sirosa Media Network on the 28th of August 2017. The report implied that I had sold shares of one of my companies to Nandana Lokuvithana and that I was protecting him. I wish to inform that in October 2008, I sold off a minority stake of 15% of Spavel Ceylon Private Limited, which owns the m and Center. I resigned from the position of director of that company and later, based on the request of the new shareholders, I served as a non-executive director. I resigned from the position as well in August 2015. Thereafter, I have had no dealings with this company and am not responsible for its transactions. The respect the people had for the parliament is deteriorating day by day. The reason is that when members and ministers make robberies and when they are caught pretended, they say, I will make a statement in parliament, I will make a clarification in parliament. And what do they do? They don't do any clarification, they just try to come and paint a little and then try to save their neck and then move. Oh, today parliament has become a place where members can come and tell lies to the public. That has been the situation today. Now, if you take, the, for instance, Mr. Malik Samara, the way the media exposed him of all, all the wrongdoing that he is doing and from his ministry, what is happening? What did he say? I will make a statement in parliament. Did he clarify anything in parliament? No. So, so many days when people waited for his clarification, but nothing came out. Lakshman Kiriyala was exposed of all the things that is happening on the highway, on the flyover. Did Mr. Kiriyala have the decency to summon the media and tell? When the media starts questioning, they get up and go. So this is the scenario and today everybody is making use of a rightful place as the worst place that people can ever see or ever go to, that is the Sri Lanka parliament. Former senior DIG of police Lalit Jaya Singh, who was arrested by the police special investigation unit this morning, was released on bail this evening after being produced before the Palmadula Magistrates Court. The former senior DIG was released on a surety of 1 million rupees. The court also ordered the suspect to report to the police special investigation unit once a week and impounded his passport. The former senior DIG was summoned today to record a statement with regard to the concealing of evidence in the alleged murder of an individual on the 5th of January 2015 in the Kahawatta Police Division. A group including former Deputy Minister Premalal Jayasekara are suspected to have been involved in the shooting. Former senior DIG Lali Jayasingha was arrested following his statement. Jayasingha was previously released on bail on charges of harboring the chief suspect in the gang rape and murder of schoolgirl Sivaloganathan Vidya. On the 28th of June, the trial began before the three Supreme Court judges at the Jaffna High Court of the murdered schoolgirl Sivaloganathan Vidya. As the trial comes to the closing stages, News First's Azra Zan reports from Jaffna. The murder of Sivaloganathan Vidya shocked the entire nation. The final verdict of the murder that took place in 2015 is scheduled to be given at the Jaffna High Court on Wednesday, the day after tomorrow. So we here at News First arrived in Jaffna a short while ago. So stay tuned to us. We will be bringing you the latest update as and when it happens. Up next is Action TV. The Director of Education in the Central Province, the Zonal Education Director in Katugastota, the Assistant Secretary to the Provincial Education Ministry and the Principal of the Alavatugoda Model Primary School arrived at the office of the Governor of the Central Province today following an order issued by the Governor. Given the incident that formed the basis for this summons, the fact that the Chief Minister was not summoned by the Governor today is akin to holding a wedding reception without the groom. The officials in question were summoned to the governor's office today for an inquiry into an incident where at around 2 a.m. on Thursday, 250 students of the Alavatugoda Model Primary School were brought to the school and taken 16 kilometers away to Gunnorua in order to participate in an activity which had no connection whatsoever to their education. 
The following statement is proof that these students were pulled out of school on a weekday to participate in this activity under the patronage of the Chief Minister of the province who also holds the portfolio of education. All of the school children here are from the Sarathe Kanaika Vidyalaya. There are about 100 children here who are dressed up and another 150 children to carry the fall of the sari. This is being supervised by the senior superintendent of police. While the chief minister did not appear for the inquiry at the governor's office today, the governor was more than willing to speak up for him. Mama. I am acquitting the chief minister in this matter. He is free of responsibility for this. When considering the information in a letter addressed by the chief minister, I must acquit him in this matter. Upon being questioned by a journalist, the governor struck a different tune. Accusations are being levelled against the school principal and the ground level officials. You say the chief minister is free of responsibility, but this was done so a friend of his could achieve a Guinness World Record. This involved him at least 90% and was done with his blessings. I do not hope to acquit the chief minister in this matter. My only goal is to punish those who have done wrong no matter who they are. But the chief minister is not entirely responsible for this. He has not asked for children to be used in this way. He has not made a request for children to do this. That is clear. I'm looking into this. The education secretary has some responsibility in this. It was proven at today's inquiry that the chief minister had addressed a letter to the zonal education director in Katugastota requesting 100 school children to participate in this activity. This letter was also copied to the principal of the Alawatugoda Primary School. It was also revealed today that the zonal education director had not issued any orders to the principal of the school and that none of the officials at the provincial education department or the provincial education ministry were involved in this incident. While the chief minister had requested 100 school children to participate in this endeavour, it was the school principal that decided to provide 250 children. The decision made today was to inquire into this matter with complete responsibility. On Friday, the National Child Protection Authority announced that it had decided to investigate this incident considering it an instance of child harassment. Amid this investigation, the NCPA has a major responsibility to educate those with political privilege that children are not playthings to be used to promote themselves. It would certainly be appropriate if the NCPA were to organize a series of workshops for politicos and officials to ensure that the message gets through. Chairperson of the NCPA, over to you. Welcome back to the news now into more local news. Transparency International Sri Lanka states it is alarmed by the lack of consultation and procedure adopted in the passage of the Provincial Council's Elections Amendment Act. Issuing a media release, Transparency International Sri Lanka notes that by making substantial committee stage amendments to the Provincial Council Elections Amendment Act, a key democratic check has been sidestepped as there is no opportunity to assess the constitutional conformity of the amendments. TISL is of the position that committee stage amendments should only be made insofar as the standing orders of Parliament permit them. It notes that an amendment to introduce a wholly new electoral system would at the very least require a discussion of principles. The release further notes that in failing to adhere to this parliamentary procedure, it seems that the legislation has been perverted to further delay elections due to the need for delimitation. While commending the government for taking steps to bring in progressive reforms such as the adoption of a mixed electoral system, Transparency International Sri Lanka also expressed caution as the public would be made aware of the new electoral system only when the act is published. Commenting on the issue, TISL Executive Director Ashok Obesekar said, quote, This is the archetypal illustration of a closed government in practice, despite the government being a member of the Open Government Partnership. However, a positive step in the bill is the inclusion of the 25% mandatory female representation. When you look at the national list uh, in the August uh, 2015 election, uh, the SLSP and the JVP didn't have a single woman uh, on its national list and the UNP um, and the TNA didn't do much better. So I think we need to be asking the question, 
why does the public why are the public not invested um, in female representation and does this have something to do with the fact that women just don't occupy kind of visible leadership positions uh, in political parties that ultimately affect their candidacy the free women movement convened a media briefing in colombo today as we speak, at least 81% of the women who are employed in the Middle East as domestic workers are being abused or even murdered. However, we don't see or hear of these problems in society. Four sisters from the estate sector came back to the country as corpses recently. Minister Talata Atukorala says that she will take care of the families and the children whose mothers and sisters are affected in this manner. What has she done? She has awarded scholarships worth 2,500 to children. What can you do for a child's education with just 2,500 rupees. The women in parliament who are warming seats raise placards in parliament calling for a 25% representation at the local government level. However, on what occasion has those ladies spoken of the 81,000 women suffering overseas as slaves? <laughs> Another phase of the Samadhi 7 program was held in Tissa Maharama today under the auspices of Minister Sajit Premadasa. Under the program, the minister provided asbestos sheets through his personal funds to a number of families who are currently living in houses with thatched roofs. The former housing minister claims that the current government passes its laws using acts of thuggery. But isn't the misuse of state assets of the Ministry of Housing and Construction also thuggery? Distributing state assets of the ministry to one's family members, isn't that thuggery? Providing ministry vehicles to henchmen and the misuse of state assets to obtain political contracts, aren't these acts of thuggery too? Journalists were murdered when his government was in power. Wasn't that thuggery? Today, the father of thuggery is saying that acts of thuggery are being implemented by the present government. Now, what does he mean when he says that we are using acts of thuggery? It is only because we are attempting to implement the electoral system at the upcoming provincial council election and we plan on replacing the present provincial council election system. This is what he claims as the present government's acts of thuggery. <laughs> A media briefing on the 8th International Maritime Conference, the Gaul Dialogue, was held in Colombo today. The theme of this year's Gaul Dialogue, which will be held on the 8th and on, rather on the 9th and 10th of October, is maritime blindness. Commander of the Sri Lanka Navy, Vice Admiral Travis Sinaya, spoke on what will be covered during the dialogue this time around. What we will be dealing with, that I told you, is everything maritime. Sea piracy will come into it, maritime crime, narcotic smuggling, human smuggling, illegal trade, gun running, terrorism, IUU, that's uh, illegal fishing, poaching, pollution, and pollution controls the environment, maritime infrastructure, shipbuilding, future of insurance. It's the complete gamut of all things maritime, right? But what we will be looking at at this time, like I told you, is again maritime blindness. And maritime blindness, blindness comes in from the lack of maritime domain awareness. What happens when a con goes horribly out of plan? This is what happened when six men posing an, as income tax officials were exposed. Uh, a crowd of around 150 locals soon gathered outside the trader's house and this is what followed. Uh, I'm Jitendi Kunasen for the News First Team. And I'm Shane Silva. Take care and good night.